everyone, it's Lacey Skulls from VH1's Rock of Love. And this is Hawk of Love, the new podcast. This isn't just reality, this is real life. Hey everyone, it's Lacey Skulls here. To those of you who regularly watch my podcast, Talk of Love, this episode that you're watching right now is not going to be a typical episode. Today, I'll be addressing something that is really important to me that I feel really needs to be discussed. But next week, the podcast will go back to normal. And I actually already have a really great guest lined up for next Monday's episode. And if you click on the community tab of this YouTube channel, or go to the Talk of Love Instagram page. You can find out who the next episode's guest will be. So those of you who personally know me or have listened to this podcast, you know how much I love music. And more specifically, you know that I'm a big, big fan of bands like Nine Inch Nails. I've also mentioned Marilyn Manson a number of times, and I really love hard rock and industrial music in general. So when these recent allegations about Marilyn Manson came to light, a lot of you were asking me for my thoughts on this. And I, of course, I've got like tons of thoughts on this. And I was like, there's no way though that I'll be able to get all of my thoughts in during just the normal opening segment that I usually do for this podcast. Um, So that is why I decided to dedicate an entire episode of my podcast to this topic specifically today. Um, Today's episode is going to be kind of like an expose and a call to action. And I'm calling this episode Predators in the Music Industry. Also, just a heads up, this is going to be a pretty heavy episode. And I want to warn everyone who's watching this, there will be a lot of triggers relating to sexual misconduct and sexual assault. So if you have PTSD or trauma or anything like that, please be advised, this is going to be triggering. An unfortunate reality is that sexual misconduct and sexual assault is prevalent in just about every facet of society. In film, there was Harvey Weinstein. In television, there was Bill Cosby. The tech companies and corporate America have had to face this truth as well. But when it comes to the music industry, in spite of decades of knowing about this and excusing sexual predators in in music, The music industry still protects predators over victims and has yet to have its day of reckoning. So today I'll be talking about my thoughts on Marilyn Manson, but I'll also be talking about the issue of sexual misconduct in the music industry. And for the purposes of this episode, when I use the words sexual misconduct, I'm saying that to include a broad range of behavior, including sexual harassment, sexual assault, everything and everything in between. So today, I want to talk about sexual misconduct in the music industry. I'll be talking about who is doing this, how are they getting away with it, why it happens. And yes, I will be naming names of both predators and the people who enable them. My goal is for this to become a part of a larger conversation that really needs to take place among every single person in the music industry. And at the end of this episode, I'll be discussing some common sense solutions that we can use to correct this problem that has been plaguing the music industry for far too long. I also want you all to know how serious I am about all of this. There will be no false accusations in this video. I will not be speculating about anything. I won't be spreading rumors. Everything I'm stating in this episode today is 100% true and legal for me to say. This cause is really important to me and I take this seriously because the bottom line is that I love music, but the sad truth is that live music is not a safe environment for girls and women. And that really sucks. Going to see live shows shouldn't be dangerous for girls and women, but right now it is. So let's get down to business. To those of you who are in the music industry and listening to me right now, this message specifically is for all of you. It's for the musicians and the bands, but it's also for the record labels. It's also for the owners of live music venues and club owners. This message is for the booking agents, the entertainment lawyers, the concert promoters, the tour managers, the crew, security. I'm speaking to all of you. And my message is this. I am asking for your help. We need you. Because when it comes to sexual misconduct in the in the music industry, things are just not ever going to get better without your help. So I'm going to be asking you to take a pledge to join with me and everybody else who wants this to end, to take a pledge to help end misconduct in the, in the music industry. And um, 
we need, we also need to implement a plan. And I'm going to be detailing that at the end of this episode. I want to point out something else though. In normal life outside of music, both women and men can be victims of sex crimes. And both women and men can be the predators. They can be the perpetrators. However, for For whatever reason, in rock music, the people who victimize fans have always been male. Now, I'm not saying this to villainize men. In fact, I have tons of guy friends and tons of professional relationships with guys and music. And literally 99.99% of the time as a woman, I have been treated with nothing but respect, nothing but kindness from the men around me. And most men in the music industry are really, really good people who are compassionate. They're woke. They genuinely care about people. So again, I'm not trying to villainize guys, but I just want you to know that that you are the ones that are in power and you're the ones that can, can do something about this. So I'm asking for your help. Also, just to clarify, in case any of you have any worry or any concern that I'm talking about something that you specifically might have done in your past, let me put your mind at ease. When I'm talking about sexual misconduct, here's what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about guys who are on tour who just like to have sex with lots of women. When I was single, I had sex with lots of people too. (laughs) There's no shame in any of that. So I'm not talking about promiscuous people. I'm also not talking about people who cheated on their girlfriend or cheated on their wife. It might make you an asshole, but (laughs) it's not, not what I'm talking about. Specifically, what I am talking about is musicians or crew members who have sex with girls who are underage. I'm talking about musicians or crew members who pressure fans into sexual situations intended to dehumanize them or degrade them or to sexually humiliate them. I'm also talking about musicians, crew, who have sex with girls who are clearly annihilated, who are slurring their speech and who are so drunk they can't even stand up or walk straight. And of course, I'm talking about rape, sexual assault, and I'm talking about sexual harassment. So that's what I'll be covering in this episode today. And those are the things specifically that I'm saying need to be cleaned up in the music industry. You know, the the phrase sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that became the mantra for rock music. And when you say sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that was supposed to depict like a wild, crazy, fun time. However, I feel like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that phrase, that mantra, that has become the problem through the years because bands started using that to try to outdo each other and be more crazy than the band before them. Some of the bands were determined to be the ones to raise the bar of debauchery and up the ante. Then there were those who were not directly involved in that, but they were witnesses and turned a blind eye. And in the wake of this, young female fans have been taken advantage of, they've been abused and completely dehumanized. And the line of common decency became so blurred that I feel like we all lost all concept of what's acceptable. Perfect example, Marilyn Manson. The stuff with Marilyn Manson started decades before we heard any of these stories from Evan Rachel Wood. In fact, in Marilyn Manson's book, Long Hard Road Out of Hell, which came out in 1998, Marilyn Manson describes how the members of the band sexually abused a deaf girl. They stripped her naked, threw lunch meat at her, tried to shove their dicks in her mouth and all kinds of other horrible things. And people, when they read that book, they they laughed. They thought it was funny. Again, the book came out in 1998. We've had 20 years to intervene with the Marilyn Manson stuff. We had plenty of warning and yet nobody stepped up. And so since then, there has been more and more victims. So we have to remember these fans, these girls, these are people. And they're people who support us, who buy our albums, who buy concert tickets and make it so that we have careers. And here's the kicker. A lot of these girls are already totally willing to have sex with us. But in spite of that, for a lot of musicians, that's just not enough, like Marilyn Manson. And then you end up in situations where girls go to shows to have a fun time and they end up getting hurt by the very bands that they're there to support. And there's no accountability. And after decades of bands behaving badly and people just accepting it, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that's how bands behave, we inadvertently created this culture of debauchery turned culture of abuse that turns fans into victims. And everyone who turns a blind eye is complicit. And I I gotta say, fans deserve better than this. The thing that really sucks is I actually loved Marilyn Manson. And so it's really, really upsetting. In fact, I actually met Marilyn Manson myself a long time ago, back in the late 
late 90s and I was probably 18 years old. So a friend of mine and I, at that time, we were fresh out of high school, getting into college, and we would go around and go see shows in different cities that were close to us. And, and Nine Inch Nails, is, as I've said, was like my band. Like I loved Nine Inch Nails so much. So we, my friend and I ended up in Florida and uh, we were staying in a hotel, saw Nine Inch Nails play. Marilyn Manson was the opening band. And uh, we went backstage afterwards and, and I actually went specifically to see Nine Inch Nails, but they had already left and gone on to the next city. But Marilyn Manson was there. And so we ended up hanging out with Marilyn Manson all night. And I got to say the the band and the singer, Marilyn Manson himself, they they were nice to me and my friend. And we went to a club afterwards and we had drinks and we just hung out. And it was, it was actually really fun. We had a really, really great night. So at the end of the night, Marilyn Manson was like, hey, let me get your phone number. And so I really didn't think much of it. I gave it to him, but I didn't think he was going to call. But a few weeks later, sure enough, Marilyn Manson called me. The funny thing is, this is this is how long ago this was. This wasn't even, um, it wasn't even a, a voicemail. It was a, literally an answering machine, like the old school kind that you hook up to your phone and you have like a little cassette tape. And I remember when Marilyn Manson left a message on my answering machine, I was so blown away by it, but that I saved the tape and I actually think I still have it somewhere. But anyway, so I was living in Dallas at the time and Marilyn Manson said that he, they were done with um, the Nine Inch Nails tour and they were doing a club tour. And so he invited me to come see them in Dallas and said, let's hang out afterwards and all that. So I went to go see Marilyn Manson play at a club called Trees in Dallas. And I remember when I first got there and I was walking in and I saw this chicken, a live chicken in a cage that was sitting on the ground, like when you first walk in. So of course I'm like, that's strange. Um, I had just, at the time in my life, again, I was about 18. I had just gotten into animal rights and I was, that was like the beginnings of me being, you know, an activist. And so I was starting to learn all this stuff about animals. And so, you know, it definitely made me raise an eyebrow, the whole chicken thing. So anyway, um, I went upstairs, there's a balcony at trees. And so I, I decided to watch the band from the, from the balcony. And as they're on stage performing about halfway through their set, the cage that I had seen earlier with the chicken in it makes its way onto the stage. And so of course I'm immediately like, Oh fuck. Like I, that's why they brought the chicken. Okay. So they're they're doing their thing. The chicken is in the cage on the stage, and uh, you know music is blaring, lights are going, and um, all of a sudden Marilyn Manson goes over and he kicks the cage really hard, and the cage goes flipping like end over end over end, and the poor chicken is like inside the cage, like flapping his wings, trying to stay upright. And I'm watching this from the second floor in horror. Then he kicks the cage one more time. The door flies open. The chicken comes out of the cage, ends up in the mosh pit and disappears into the crowd. So I am like, holy shit, I just watched an animal get tortured to death. So I was horrified. Now I will tell you, I didn't find this out until weeks later, but apparently there was a guy in that mosh pit that was a big animal lover, thank fucking God. He grabbed the chicken and basically shielded it, ran outside, took the chicken to his car and he ended up finding an animal sanctuary uh, animal sanctuary where he was able to take the chicken and he saved its life, you know? And so, but at the time I, I didn't see that. I just saw it disappear into the crowd. So I was furious, you know? I mean, it's one thing to put on a wild, crazy show, but like torturing animals for the sake of a show is just not okay. So I went to my car, I got my Marilyn Manson CD. I stood by the tour bus and waited for them to be done with the show. Marilyn Manson got off the tour bus and um, he saw me standing there and he was like, oh, hey, what's up? You know, thinking we're going to hang out. And I was like, you fucking asshole. And I just went off on him. And it was so long ago, I don't remember exactly what I said to him, but I do remember I really, really let him have it. And I said, I don't want your fucking CD anymore. And I handed it to him. And I remember he was really kind of like, flabbergasted. Like he was just looking at me like a deer in the headlights and he didn't really say anything at all. But then when I handed him his CD, he looked at it and he just like let it fall to the ground. And he walked onto the bus and, and that was that. So now fast forward several years and I ended up at a club one night and I think it was, it was in Dallas. Yeah. I ended up at a club and Marilyn Manson had been through town again and the band ended up at this club. And I remember going up to Marilyn Manson. And it, again, it had been years since the chicken incident. And I went up to him. I'm like, hey, what's up? And he was looking at me. And I remember he didn't recognize me at first, but I could see that he could tell that he'd met me somewhere. And the wheels were like turning in his head. 
And then he stops, he looks at me, he's like, you, you're the chicken girl. <laughs> I was like, well, I've been called worse. And um, he was like, you know, just so you know, the chicken didn't die. There was a guy that, you know, took it to an animal sanctuary. I'm like, yeah, I, I found that out. But like, it didn't die, no thanks to you, you know. But then I end up saying to him, you know what? I didn't do anything any differently than you would have done had you been in a similar situation. Marilyn Manson's very outspoken. If he has something to say, if he has feelings about something, he's gonna say it. And I'm the same way. So when I said that to him, he sort of understood and and, and that was that. And he was cool with me after that. And what's really funny is several of his uh his crew guys down the road ended up telling me that he was a big fan of Rock of Love, which is really funny. But, but anyway, so that that was my experience with Marilyn Manson, and um, you know there are so many studies that show that people who are abusive towards animals end up being abusive towards people later on in life. That's that is a very very common pattern among people who do this sort of thing. So it, it makes sense. And I didn't spend enough time around him to be in a situation where I could be personally abused by him. But given the fact that he did that to an animal for the sake of making a crazy show, it, it totally makes sense. And what really sucks, and I think a lot of you can relate to this who are Marilyn Manson fans, you know, I loved that that band. I loved their music, but I also loved the fact that he would would go on all these different talk shows and everybody wanted to give him a hard time about how he dressed and what he looked like and what kind of music it was. And since I was always in that scene, I grew up listening to goth music, industrial music and all that. And people always gave me shit for the music I listened to and, and thought it was like, made you a Satanist or all this like, you know, stupid assumptions. And Marilyn Manson was so smart, so well-spoken, so articulate when he went on these shows. And he really put all these talk show hosts in their place, most notably Bill O'Reilly on Fox News. I'm not a Bill O'Reilly fan at all. And when Marilyn Manson went on Bill O'Reilly's show and just owned him, just schooled him, it was great. And I felt like Marilyn Manson was defending the scene and defending that music and saying everything that I've always wanted to say to somebody that questioned me wearing all black or questioned what I look like or crazy red hair, or am I a Satanist or am I a druggie or, you know, all these like really negative assumptions, you know? So I thought he was speaking for us and he did it so eloquently. And Bill O'Reilly and all of these other talk show hosts were basically saying, you're an evil person, you're an evil influence, and, and kids are gonna grow up, listen to your evil music and be evil too. And we as fans defended Marilyn Manson. And what he did in abusing all of these people is he proved Bill O'Reilly to be correct. It was a big betrayal to all of us fans who backed Marilyn Manson, who said, no, no, this guy is not evil. Just because he dresses this way, sings this kind of music, it doesn't make him a bad person. And we were betrayed. We became the fools. Bill O'Reilly and everybody else who has something to say, they were right, you know? And it's it's really sucks. You know, it, he made fools of all of us. And not only that, but, you know, we loved his music. And so now we're all putting in a position of like, well, should we listen to his music anymore? Should we not? Should radio stations play his music? Should they not? It's, it put everybody in a really fucked up situation, not even getting to the victims. And that's a whole other conversation in of itself. But, um, but yeah, it, it is, it's a mind fuck and it really sucks. It's really upsetting. And I'm really, really, really disappointed by the whole entire thing. So you might be asking yourself, why, why am I doing this? Why am I taking on this topic? Well, first of all, people who know me know that I have been an activist all of my life for various causes. I'm always outspoken when it comes to injustices, things I care about. I, as I said, when I was 18, I became an animal rights activist. I'm also a big advocate for the LGBTQ community. I am a supporter of Black Lives Matter. I am an activist. That is who I am. I will always be outspoken when it comes to injustice. The other reason this is really hits close to home for me is the fact that I myself was sexually abused quite badly when I was about five years old and it lasted several several years. I know how, how devastating sexual abuse is. I know what it does to your brain. It's, it's horrific. Nobody should ever have to endure that. 
Then as an adult, and I, I haven't talked about this publicly yet, but as an adult, I was actually sexually assaulted in a hotel room by somebody who I have a ton of mutual friends with who plays drums in a very well-known rock band. Neither of those people who hurt me were ever brought to justice. And so, yeah, this is, this is personal to me. And I couldn't stop the people who hurt me, but I sure as hell can stop people who are hurting other people. The thing is, I love music so much. It's such a big part of my life. I have tons of musician friends. I'm a musician myself. And I feel like this is like my little world. And these predators are destroying it, not only for me, but for so many others. I've always been an outspoken person and this shit is toxic. So on behalf of the fans, I want to reclaim my industry from these awful, awful people who are ruining it for everyone. I already talked about Marilyn Manson as one example of what happens when you enable bad behavior, but I'm gonna list a few more examples of um, different people who have done the same kind of thing. The next one I'm gonna talk about is Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I wanna preface this by saying, I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They have always been one of my favorite bands. I've been listening to them since I was 14 years old, um, since Mother's Milk. I only recently learned all the things I'm about to tell you. And I will tell you that when I found this stuff out, I cried for an hour because I love that band so much. And this stuff, it's, it's so upsetting and it's so fucked up that people around them allow this shit to happen. It's, it's awful. In his book, Scar Tissue, Anthony Kiedis openly brags about having sex with a girl that he knew was 14 years old, which is totally illegal. He also casually mentions that he moved in with a 15-year-old when he was 25. So why is this a problem? Here's the deal. 14-year-olds do not have the mental capacity to consent to sex with adults. They also don't have the mental capacity to make informed decisions about things like drinking alcohol or joining the military or watching a rated R movie, buying cigarettes, driving a car, owning a gun, buying a lottery ticket, signing a legally binding contract. Teenagers who are under 18 can't legally do any of that. And the people who made these laws understand that the brain of a child or a young teenager is not fully developed. And therefore, they're not capable yet of making judgment calls that are good for their well being. Furthermore, when you compare the psychology of an adult male and compare that with the psychology of a not yet developed premature brain of a teenage girl, of course the man has advantages over her. If the adult man sets his predatory sights on a teenage girl, the ability that he has to manipulate her into seemingly consensual sex is it's like taking candy from a baby. Compared to a teen girl, an adult has the ability to Jedi mind trick her into doing probably just about anything that he wants. And then you add to the fact that he is a famous rock star and she's a fan. The power structure is not, it's not the same. So manipulating her is easy. There are laws in place for this exact reason. And these fans, these young fans are vulnerable. And that's why it's particularly evil when people target them sexually. Also, psychologists say that there is a huge difference between the way that young boys handle this type of thing versus how young girls handle this. There have been tons of studies that show that underage girls who are engaged in sexual relationships with adults, even if it seems fine in the moment. With young girls, it oftentimes leads to shame, self-esteem issues, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-harm, cutting, substance abuse, and suicide. It really, really fucks them up. So it is our job as adults to protect them. On top of all that, you have to remember, society treats men who are sexually active very differently from how it treats women who are sexually active. The negative labels and judgment that comes with a woman's sexuality, it is just too much for a little girl's psyche to be able to handle. Uh, her, her, little, her little brain is not equipped to handle that kind of thing. So in his book, Anthony Kiedis talks about having sex with a girl that he knew was 14. And then he talks about living with a girl who was 15. In a totally separate incident in 1990, Anthony Kiedis was convicted of sexual battery. Apparently, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were playing a show and afterwards, 
Anthony Kiedis came across a girl who was a young college student and somehow he ended up putting his dick on the girl's face outside of the dressing room. And uh, as a result, he ended up getting um, arrested and charged. This is frat boy style bullying. And as I was doing this research, I also found a video that shows the Red Hot Chili Peppers doing a show in the UK. And afterwards, I guess they're mock gang raping the female host of the, the female co-host of the show that they were on. Uh, take a look at this video. Lambada, Lambada, Lambada. Ah, right. That's uh, that's the uh, end of the show. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, oh. Out this way. Uh, Will, uh, Cleo, <coughs> Cleo, can you Lambada over there with him? Is that okay? Uh, he does He does it rather well too. Ah, now that's uh, nearly the end of the show. I'm sorry about that, Cleo. Uh, I had to uh, cut. Is it, what is it? Is he good? Is it pretty, 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 pretty? Oh, excuse me, just a minute. Wait, could it, wait. Sorry, no, Carlos, Cleo. No, no, no. no, no. Right. Cheers. Now, normally at this, are you all right there, Cleo? Because yes, I'm making, <laughs> I'm making sure. Don't help, will you? No, no, no. You leave it to me. Because if I bounce any more pop stars out of here, I'm going to get myself a oh, very right? bad yeah, reputation. I've got a lovely foot what? here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, for goodness sake. Hang on, just a minute. Just a minute. She's falling out of her dress, for God's sake. <laughs> Don't help, will you? No, no, no. I'm, sorry I'm, I'm that, peeping. Yeah. I'm peeping. All right? Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll delve into the, um, yep. the realms of art, for art's sake. And... Um, these are the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You're probably going to see a lot more of the Red Hot Chili Peppers Who's before we finish. Again? Oh, this is and the man having a vasectomy on the Atlantic program. 252. Uh, live music on the show. Yeah. Don't forget, don't forget and a year's that. supply of um, <laughs> toilet <laughs> piss, uh, uh, tissue. Yeah. Yes. And I'm yes. on in Acton oh, on the 20th of June. Uh, um, but right. Apart from okay, that, I think, have we said Excuse me. I'm I'm engaged to this woman. Could you think? Have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Bye. Look, please, for goodness' sake. Week. What's happening in art? What's not? Send in your art. Vasectomy on the radio. Um, excuse, excuse, excuse me. Uh, look, for goodness' sake, how can anybody with all this long hair? Like that. <laughs> the woman in the video, although she seems to be trying to laugh it off, when you really look, she is clutching her top. She is clutching the jacket that the host is giving her. She's hugging it to her body. And when Anthony Kiedis crawls up in front of her on the ground, she extends her arm out and puts her hand on his shoulder like she's trying to keep him at a distance. She's like squeezing her legs together and pulling her legs up away from him. And the whole time she's clutching onto the arm of the host, like she's afraid that she's going to get dragged away. Literally, Everything in that woman's body language is showing that she is not cool with this. And it sucks because I feel like a lot of us have been in that kind of situation, yet nobody wants to yell out, cut it the fuck out to the red hot chili peppers, especially while they're recording a TV show. It really put her in a horrible situation. And this is why we've got to talk about this stuff and teach this stuff to people before it gets to a situation like this. Because by the time this happens, it's, it's too late. And the other thing too is like young guys who don't know any better, they're gonna watch this, you know, especially fans of, of Anthony Kiedis, fans of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, they're gonna watch this video and they're gonna laugh and think it's funny and, and possibly even learn that it's okay to do this to women. By the way, the woman in the video, she isn't just some idiot. She's actually a UK-based comedy actress. She's a producer. She's a presenter. Her name is Cleo Rokos, and she's done a lot of work in television in the UK. And she became the founder of her own company, Aqua Riva Tequila. So she's not just some random nobody off the street, uh, but they certainly treated her like she was just a piece of garbage. Notice that they don't do this to the men in the video. They treat the men very respectfully. But... Even if she was just some random person off the street, it doesn't matter. We can't keep perpetuating this type of culture in our music scene where women are just sexualized punching bags. And I'm asking all men, please step up. Please help stop this. If you see this kind of behavior, stand up for us. In the state of Alabama, there was a politician named Roy Moore, you might remember. He ran for a spot in the U.S. Senate. And uh, yep, this, this is a photo of him from 2017. It's the hilarious moment where the night before Alabama's Senate runoff, Roy Moore pulled a gun out of his pocket while he was on stage and was waving it around at a campaign rally. This was his way of proving that he, quote, believed in the Second Amendment. I, I would have believed him without that. <laughs> but um, that same year, which was 2017, 
Roy Moore also made headlines when multiple women came forward stating that he had sexually assaulted them. Several of them said that they were underage when it happened, the youngest being 14. People were really upset by this and they were disturbed by it. And it ended up ultimately costing Roy Moore the election. Another politician, Anthony Weiner, you might remember him. He was the politician who represented New York's ninth congressional district from 1999 until 2011. And my thoughts are, if you're gonna commit sex crimes, maybe you should change your name. <laughs> anyway, uh, in 2017, same year as Roy Moore, as those allegations, Anthony Weiner pled guilty to a sexting charge of sending obscene pictures to a minor. Yes, Anthony Weiner sent pictures of his Weiner to an underage girl. He was sentenced to 21 months in federal prison and his career in politics was done. So I'm only telling you this to help you draw the comparison between how things are handled in other facets of life. In this example, how things were handled in um, politics versus how things are handled in music. People were horrified about Roy Moore and they were horrified about Anthony Weiner. Yet people in the music industry are not only not outraged when they hear these types of stories, but they are accepting of rock stars who literally do the same thing. What is the difference between Roy Moore and Anthony Kiedis? Both of them allegedly had sex with underage girls. The only difference is the fact that Roy Moore has denied all of these allegations and Anthony Kiedis admitted to it. Yet Roy Moore is the one who lost his career and Anthony Kiedis, his career is thriving for literally doing the same thing. Then there's a punk rock singer who goes by Front Porch Step, but his real name is Jake McElfresh. So similar to Anthony Weiner, Jake McElfresh also sent pictures of his Weiner to underage girls who he knew were underage. But did he go to prison like Anthony Weiner did? Nope. He went on tour, specifically the Warped Tour, which is an all ages tour. So fans were so upset that this predator was going to be on stage performing that 13,000 fans signed a petition begging Warp Tour to drop this guy from their bill. And did Warp Tour listen? Nope. Instead, the founder of Warp Tour, Kevin Lyman, decided, well, he knows best, he made a deal with Jake McElfresh saying that if McElfresh went to sex rehab for eight weeks and didn't do it again, then Kevin Lyman would allow him to play at the All Ages Warp Tour as part of his, get this, as part of his sex addi addiction rehabilitation. But when one of McElfresh's victims sent Kevin Lyman proof that McElfresh was violating the terms of his sex rehab, Kevin Lyman let him play on stage anyway. So my question is, how are girls supposed to enjoy shows where predators are the entertainment? You're asking people to ignore the fact that people have been accused of sexually abusing young girls and they're on stage and you want us to just sit back and enjoy the show. So is live music even for girls? Is the music industry just one big boys club? Because that's what it feels like a lot of the time. When Billboard magazine interviewed the founder of Warp Tour, he said that sexual harassment is just, quote, part of the culture. Kevin Lyman, you are the problem. And it's interesting to me because people have no tolerance for this kind of shit when politicians do it. Even Harvey Weinstein, everybody agreed he was a monster. Same thing with Bill Cosby. People were disgusted by Jared from Subway. Remember him? But every rock star gets a free pass. It, that doesn't make any sense to me. Let's talk about the band Blood on the Dance Floor. According to Loudwire, the band singer Davey Vanity, he, he's been accused of rape and sexual assault by 21 women, 16 of which were underage. In fact, an expose by the Huffington Post documented a long list of allegations against Davey Vanity, who was 35 years old, by the way, including allegations of forced oral sex and rape. Ash Costella, singer of the band New Year's Day, New Year's Day she was almost choked to death by Davey Vanity. And I want to take a second real quick. I got to give a shout out to the band Kami Christ. Kami Christ are great guys, good friends of mine. Kami Christ was supposed to tour with Blood on the Dance Floor in 2014. But when they found out about these, these allegations, Kami Christ kicked them off the bill. That, that is rare that a band reacts that way when they hear these kinds of allegations. So I applaud Kami Christ for doing the right thing. Let's talk about Trip Eisen now. 
Chip Eisen is a guy that probably a lot of you have, have heard of. He used to play guitar for the band's Dope and the band Static X, both of which later fired him. He also played with the band Murder Dolls, which is a side project from Joey Jordison of Slipknot. Currently, Trip Eisen plays in a band called Face Without Fear. Not once, but two separate times. In 2005, Trip Eisen was arrested for sexually assaulting underage girls. He was convicted and he was sent to prison. Where is Trip Eisen now? Well, he's back playing in bands again. By the way, all of the members of Dope and all of the members of Static X have publicly denounced him. But online rock magazines and websites, most notably Blabbermouth, they're fully promoting this two-time convicted child sex predator. Some people have said, well, he served his time. I don't fucking care. Study after study shows that once a predator, always a predator. Blabbermouth wants this guy to get more fans or promoting him. So why? He can get more fans so he can be put right back in the same exact environment of which he found his victims the first time. You really want to put the wolf back in the hen house and promote him? I mean, God, like, let's get him more hens. What could go wrong? At the same time that Trip Eisen was finding his underage victims, which was in 2005, there was another band that was actually touring with Trip's band at the same time. So Trip's band, which was dope, and then another band called Society One, those two bands performed together on a tour called the $12 Riot Tour. So let's talk about the band Society One for a bit and specifically the guitar player named Sin Corinne. Now, Sin Corinne was somebody that I ended up getting to know quite well. In 2010, I was asked to sing for the band Lords of Acid live on tour just for the for the summer. And Sin Corinne was the guitar player for Lords of Acid. So he and I were touring together the whole summer on that tour and um, we ended up dating. So after the tour was over, I ended up dating Sin Corinne for about 10 months. And I thought I knew who this guy was, but I was totally wrong. So 10 months after I started dating this guy, I received an email on Facebook from another guy who I didn't know, and he was basically calling Sin a pedophile. So when I read this email, I was horrified. I was like, why is this guy telling me this? And Sin had told me a number of times about an ex-girlfriend of his, a girl named Kelly, and he told me a lot of stories about Kelly. So the guy who emailed me told me that he was actually friends with Kelly as well, and that Kelly was indeed Sin's ex-girlfriend. But when Kelly and Sin started dating, Kelly was 15 years old. Sin was in his 30s. So when I learned this, I was horrified. I remember I was shaking. I was so, so upset. I, I can't even put words to describe how upsetting it was for me to to learn this information. So the first thing I did was I called Sin. I told him what this guy had had said to me. And I said, we need to talk. And he's like, okay, that's fine. But he wanted me to meet him in person to have this conversation. I met with Sin in person and I said, I'm really disturbed by this. Is this true? And to that, Sin answered, yes, yes, it is true. She was 15 years old when we started dating. And he began making all kinds of excuses. He started saying that he got his her mother's permission, which I found out that wasn't true. Um, he made all kinds of excuses. And I was like, that's horrifying. You are a pedophile and I can't be with you. So I broke up with him and it was really, really, really disturbing. I had been dating a freaking pedophile for 10 months. Shortly after Sin and I broke up, I actually received another email from the girl, Kelly herself. The first thing that she did was introduce herself. She apologized to me saying that she didn't mean to bring drama into my life, but she did say, this is true. Sin manipulated me into a sexual relationship when she was 15 years old. It was very damaging to her. She ended up depressed, anxious, suicidal. It was really, really bad for her. Sin did a lot of damage to this girl. And it was it was upsetting to me, you know? Um, so then I eventually ended up coming forward with this information because the thing is I knew that Sin had been 
playing all ages shows. And I was wondering if there was other victims. So I made a Facebook post and I, I put this information out there of what I knew about Sin Corinne. Sure enough, I got lots of emails from lots of young girls saying similar stories of Sin basically preying upon them. Sometimes the girls were underage, sometimes they were of age, but a lot of people painted him to be a predator. Let me um, give you an example. I'm just going to grab my um, computer. There is one girl that I actually met through Sin himself. And, um, and he called her a good friend. She called him a good friend. But when all of this came to the surface, she just got to a place in her life where she's like, I just, I can't deal with being friends with this type of person anymore. She wrote me an email in 2014. She said, Lacey, Sin and I's friendship goes back to the early days of the band Society One. I myself was an underage girl. I consider myself to be the lucky one. I remember Sin hitting on me and um, he wanted my attention. He wanted me to go to the van with him. Um, I asked myself what a grown man like Sin wanted with a little girl from the Midwest, but I ate it up. I felt good to say that my best friend is Sin. He called me every night and told me that he loved me. We talked and texted all day long too for years. Uh, then she talks about how she actually met Kelly when Kelly was 15 years old. And she said, when I met Kelly, this 15 year old girl from Texas, she was so in love with Sin and he had never told me about her, but when I talked to her, she stated that they'd been seeing each other for years. At this time, Kelly was underage. And as I was going back and looking at through my old pictures, I saw that Sin wore a K bracelet on his wrist for Kelly. Soon after the tour, I would go and see him and his arm would be lined with little girl's bracelets. It was disgusting. Yet I sat back, still being his friend, telling him to find somebody legal. I lay here feeling guilty for not doing something about it then. But my voice was small and I didn't want to lose my quote unquote friends. So this is one of Sin's really, really close friends who gave me all this information. I had another girl that came forward that said that Sin had sexually manipulated her into sleeping with him when she was underage and her sister was a witness and she said it did a lot of damage to her as well. Then in 2014, I saw another, uh, I came across another girl who posted on her Facebook page that she was a clothing designer and she wanted to work a deal with uh, with Sin. And he came over to her house and he sexually harassed her and he pressed his dick up against her when he was hard. And she said she was she was horrified and she was terrified. So this is a pattern that this, this guy does this on a regular basis, or at least he did back then. And as we know, a lot of times when people do this kind of thing, they usually don't stop unless they get help. And, you know, here's the thing. You guys might be saying, aren't you slandering sin right now? Usually people use the word allegedly. He allegedly did this. He allegedly did that. No, I know this is true because sin told me to my face. And also, why do you think that sin hasn't sued me yet? Because he knows that what I'm saying is true. And he would be terrified to bring me into a courtroom where I can bring all this evidence, all these screenshots that I have, all these emails I have from all these different girls. He doesn't want me in a courtroom showing all this stuff that I have, swearing, you know, on the Bible, being under oath, saying everything that I know. He doesn't want that. That's why he's not bringing me into a courtroom because he knows everything I'm saying is true and it's disgusting. And the uh, there's a magazine, Billboard, uh, they actually ended up doing an 11 month long investigation into this whole Sin Corinne stuff. They talked to a lot of the victims and um, also Matt Zane, who was Sin's old bandmate and his buddy, Matt Zane was sticking up for Sin and saying that um, that I had Photoshopped the screenshots. So I actually had the, the uh, journalist from Billboard I gave her my passwords, my login, all of my information. So she's in New York. And so she could, from her New York office, log into my Yahoo account, my Facebook account, which she did. So she could verify these are not doctored screenshots. I invited her to go through all of my emails, to read the emails that Matt Zane sent me, to read the emails that these girls had sent me. She verified that all of this was true. Something that really bothers me is when Billboard eventually did put the story out. A lot of other magazines having to do with rock music, they carried the story as well. And this information was out there. Um, 
Also, I might add that when this investigation by Billboard was taking place, I ended up speaking on the phone with somebody who actually used to work with ministry, used to book them. And he would tell me that ministry, the band would have band meetings without sin and they would have open discussions about the fact that sin was bringing around underage girls and sleeping with underage girls. And the band ministry was like, what are we gonna do with sin? They were worried that what he was doing with these underage girls was gonna bring down ministry. So when this article came out in Billboard, which happened in January of just last year, 2020, um, it was very strange because ministry, who by the way, I was and still am a huge, huge fan of ministry. I love that band. I grew up listening to, you know, Psalm 69 and The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste. All those albums are incredible. I love that band. I've met Al Jurgensen a number of times and he was always really cool to me. I don't have an ax to grind with ministry, except for the fact that when this information came out, instead of putting out a statement about Sin Corinne doing this and saying that we we reject this kind of behavior, we, we don't condone this, and we're letting Sin go from the band. Instead of that, they turned all of their social media accounts private, and they turned off their comments on Instagram. And so what ended up happening was a bunch of the fans of ministry ended up going to ministry's Twitter and asking the band, please tell us about Sin Corinne. What is, are you keeping him in the band? Are you kicking him out of the band? And what ended up happening was ministry would delete those comments and block the people that were asking simply for an explanation from Al Jurgensen, from ministry. Why are you keeping this guy in the band? Why are you protecting him? Why are you not, listening to your fans who, who love ministry and don't wanna to go to shows and see a fucking pedophile on stage. People have a right to ask these questions. And instead of ministry or Al Jurgensen coming forward and denouncing this, instead he deleted the comments and blocked the people asking the questions. I remember I got blocked. I remember the, the woman who was writing the article with Billboard Magazine, she got blocked. They were protecting sin, essentially, and um, and sweeping the story under the rug. So my request from Al Jorgensen, and I encourage all of you to go to ministry social media and do the same thing. Please, Al, please give us your perspective about what's, what these accusations about sin are. I ask that you please don't protect him. I ask that you please take the side of these victims and get this shit out of your band. You know, I know that um, Sin has another band that he recently started called Three-Headed Snake. One of the guys, Caesar from Ministry, is in the band Three-Headed Snake with Sin Corinne. They're still planning on doing their thing. I don't understand why these people are, are backing Sin. I, I don't understand it. And um, in fact, there's a record label who I've always been a big fan of them called Cleopatra Records. And they recently said that they have signed Three-Headed Snake, Sin Corinne's band. Even though there's so much information about the fact that Sin has been... Um, basically sexually assaulting minors. And yes, it's sexual assault because there is no such thing as consent when it comes to underage girls. So I reached out to Cleopatra Records. I know the head of Cleopatra, Brian. I reached out to him via email a number of times. And I said, we need to have this discussion. I, I don't want to see one of my favorite record labels who's put out so much great music over decades, Cleopatra Records. I don't want to see them being another enabler of somebody who has been accused of sexual crimes and especially sexual crimes against minors. So I reached out to Brian. I reached out to Cleopatra. I, I told them that I was getting ready to do this episode of this podcast about this subject. I couldn't get the guy to write me back. I've talked to this guy so many times in my past, but when I ask him for accountability about the bands that he's signing to his label and the fact that one of them has been accused of sex crimes against a minor, he can't be bothered to write me back or to respond to it. And to me, this once again looks like enabling. We're not protecting the fans, we're protecting the predators. And it really shouldn't be that way. Um, let's get back to um, the band Society One. Um, what's crazy is that when 
Trip Eisen, who was in the band Dope. Dope was touring at the same time as Society One. That is when Sin found Kelly, the victim that was 15 years old. So basically all these types of guys, they tour together. They play all ages shows together. They find each other and they all do it. Um, Matt Zane, whose who's band Society One is, let me tell you a little bit about him. Now, before I start though, I will tell you, Matt Zane, he has posted this several times on his Facebook page. He thinks that I am just after him for whatever reason. He thinks that I just wanna take him down for whatever reason. And he doesn't understand why I'm, I'm outing him. The reason, this all started, God, like probably 12, 13, 14 years ago when um, I was at the Whiskey A Go Go in Hollywood one night and Edsel was in the building. Edsel is the singer of Dope, who's a good friend of mine, who has denounced all this kind of behavior and who has denounced Trip Eisen. And um, Edsel was at the Whiskey. Matt Zane from Society One shows up and Matt Zane sucker punched Edsel in the face. Edsel was bleeding. It was a whole big scene. And I thought that was shitty. Matt Zane literally sucker punched a guy who I consider to be my friend. So I fucking has something to say about it. And um, ever since then, he just thinks I'm going after him just because. But honestly, it really doesn't have anything to do with that is the fact that Matt Zane has done fucked up shit too. Let's talk about it because Matt Zane is also still in the music industry. He does videos, he gets hired by bands, but bands need to know what Matt Zane's past looks like. So here we go. Matt Zane, I'm gonna read this to make sure I get all these facts straight. Matt Zane is, was a porn director and he's a front man for Society One. Society One is the band that Sin Corinne used to play guitar for. Um, and uh, this is from the website last.fm. This is their bio. Society One first rose to notoriety in 1999 with their debut album, Slacker Jesus, earning massive press coverage through such media outlets as MTV, VH1, Billboard, Rolling Stone, Spin, etc. Adding to the media frenzy was the fact that Matt Zane was an acclaimed porn director gaining worldwide infamy for his video, quote, Backstage Sluts. Um, it's a series of films which matched porn stars with such real life rockers at, as Limp Bizkit's Fred Durst, Korn's Jonathan Davis, and Sugar Ray's Mark McGrath. Um, so essentially, Matt would go backstage at all these shows, have all these rocker comes in, come rocker guys come in and have sex with the female fans, and then they would film it and put it out. Um, according to a Spin Magazine article that was published in November of 1998, and you can still find this online, uh, during the backstage sluts video, Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray talks about underage groupies and their moms. Again. Go find this. This was Mark McGrath who stated this in Spin Magazine. Um, it, should be no, it should be noted that Mark McGrath later publicly stated that he was ashamed of being involved in the Backstage Sluts videos and that he greatly regretted it. Um, I also want to read you um, an article that was published February 8th, 2006 in the Detroit Metro Times. This was written by Brian Smith and it's entitled Confessions of a Smut Reviewer. Brian Smith writes, six months earlier, I was in LA. Another writer and I had pitched a porn story to details, which was to focus on 22 year old Matt Zane, then the youngest director in porn. Zane's videos included rock stars um, slumming it with porn sluts, quote unquote. I later saw Matt Zane as blatant marketing manipulation to get the rock and roll kids' attention. Regrettably, I'd given Matt Zane's stuff favorable reviews in the past and had gotten to know him. Um, the, there was a video that Matt Zane did where there was a girl that was being filmed having anal sex. And Brian Smith writes, the girl losing her anal cherry was a Zoftig San Diego stripper in Los Angeles for the gig. This was her porn debut. When she walked out of the bathroom to the living room, which was the set for her scene, it was obvious that she was terrified. It was all over her 19 year old lily white face. Soon the anal scene began. This girl was obviously unaccustomed to the rush of pain associated with the act. And she didn't know how to do it. Her ruddy face showed sweat and agony. She was ordered to smile. 
Hard man began pumping hard. I could see tears, which would no doubt be left on the cutting room floor. Matt Zane's contempt for this girl was barely concealed. My thought, how can you be allowed to direct porn if you don't adore women? Matt Zane could only order her to feign joy. When it was over, he ignored her. This was mass-produced porn, sure, but it was bad porn. Worse, barely consensual, just ugliness, no sexuality at all. I could only think of this girl... Hence my loathing for such self-promoting, women-hating dopes as Matt Zane. So that's what this guy, Brian Smith, writes. I want to read you another article that was published in um, the year 2000 on April 6th in the Dallas Observer. It was written by T. Eric Schultz, and it's entitled, Get Your Tatas Out. Um, In this article, uh, it's talking about... Matt Zane, who is directing a music video for the band Pimpadelic. During the filming of the video, author T. Eric Schultz writes, within seconds after what seems like the 20th take, the door flies open and a tearful young woman flies out, grasping, gasping for her top, which at this point is almost around her ankles. Mumbling, she marches upstairs, vowing to leave and never come back. Here's one more for you. Coincidentally, um, the name of this title, which is published in antimusic.com, uh, there's an article Funny enough, called Society One Pulls a Manson. And it says, Society One's Matt Zane has ran into some trouble with the law yet again, this time for shoving a girl's face into his crotch during a show. According to recent media reports, Zane offered the heckler, who is a woman later revealed to be 17 years old, the chance to approach the stage and speak her mind about the band into the microphone. The heckler accepted Matt Zane's offer, but found herself humiliated in front of the entire room when, instead of allowing her to speak, Matt Zane quickly removed the microphone, grabbed her head, slammed her face into his crotch. Which, given the fact that the girl was 17, that's totally illegal. She was underage, and Matt Zane was arrested for assault at that show. So the point of me telling you these stories is that Matt Zane is not a good guy either. He clearly does not have respect for women. He has been violent towards women. He's been arrested uh, before um, having to do with his treatment of women. And Mark McGrath is making statements in Spin Magazine insinuating that some of the girls and some of his videos might be underage. So this is something that we really have to look at because Matt Zane... Sin Corinne, they were they were touring together at the same time as Trip Eisen, and all these guys were going after underage girls. And the thing that is upsetting to me is that this is all out in the open, and yet nobody had anything to say about it. And people were not only excusing it and going, oh, they're just wild and crazy guys, but young girls were genuinely getting hurt within all of this and nobody stepped forward to protect them. Nobody stepped forward to tell Society One or Trip Eisen to knock it the fuck off. And, you know, I mean, God only knows how many other people were hurt at the hands of these guys. The last thing I want to tell you about Matt Zane is that when I first started going public, this was after 2010, and I started telling people about what I knew about sin. He, from my perspective, is a predator and a danger to any girl that goes to any of his all ages shows. So I had reached out to Matt Zane because, you know, as I said, he was touring with sin when all of this stuff was supposedly happening. Uh, I received a private email from Matt Zane on Facebook. And again, I had the uh, journalist who works for Billboard log into my Facebook page so she can verify that this email is real and I'm not making this up. Um, Matt Zane says to me, um, I'm sorry to hear about what happened in your relationship with Sin. If I only had a dime for every girl that wrote to me a similar story regarding that guy. He screwed me over really bad as well as in other aspects of life that involves so much lying and, and deceit. So I know how you feel. If I knew that introducing him to people that that would lead him to the ability to tour and abuse people, I would have never done it. I thought I was being a good friend and it didn't come out until later how much of a pedophile sin was. If I had known, he would have been out of the band and he would have gone back to tinting windows instead of being introduced to the band ministry. Honestly, I knew about Sin's fascination with young girls and I did catch him crossing the line a few times. But although the the major situation where he was sleeping with a 15-year-old regularly was wrong, he said that he would marry her when she turned legal. At the time, I turned the other cheek. 
As I said, it wasn't until later that dozens of girls came forward to me through the website, MySpace at the time, and told me what sin was really doing to people on the road. Over the next year, I learned through so many people that he had destroyed so many young girls' lives and took their virginity as well, broke up engagements and ruined relationships. The 15-year-old's name is Kelly and she lives in Texas. Perhaps that's the one that you're speaking about. As far as the other girls, I am not in touch with any of them. It has been years since people knew sin was in my band and I am sure a lot of them are just trying to put it in their past. Listen, my take is that that guy sin is pure evil. I don't want anything to do with him. What he did to me and the way he treats people, the way he ditched his own kid, he's just bad news. I don't want to invite any of that energy back into my life. He is a wrecking ball. So that's what Matt Zane said to me at first. However, a couple of years later, for whatever reason, Matt Zane suddenly changed his tune. Suddenly he's friends with Sin again. And when he was asked about that email that he wrote, he went, oh, I didn't mean any of that. I was on drugs. I I was lying because I was mad at Sin, so I was making it up. But it just so happens that the words that Matt Zane typed in that email correlates with what all the other girls who came forward to me, told me about sin. And suddenly Matt's saying, oh, I I didn't mean it. I made it up. Well, what Matt Zane has proven is that he is a liar. So either he was lying then or he's lying now. But one of the two, Matt Zane is lying. And suddenly for a reason that I don't understand, Matt Zane is now covering for sin and trying to protect him. One thing I also wanna point out is that when Billboard magazine first started doing their investigation into in, into Sin Corin, uh, before they actually put the, the article out, but they were still doing the investigation, my husband randomly got a phone call one day from none other than ministries manager, Steve Davis. And he called my husband and basically told him that I need to stop using the the band name ministry when I'm talking about Sin Corinne. I mean, all I was doing, I, I wasn't saying that ministry was doing anything wrong. I was specifically talking about Sin Corinne, but I'm sorry, Sin Corinne is in the band ministry. So when I say Sin Corinne of ministry, that is just to identify who this person is. And Steve Davis basically called my husband, told my husband to tell me to stop using the name ministry when I'm talking about this story, which is ridiculous. I have every right to say that. Send Corinne from ministry. He is in the band. But the manager was basically like, yeah, but he did all these things before he was in the band. But it doesn't matter. He's in ministry now. And this information needs to get out to the public that this guy is a predator. What was really fucked up is when Steve Steve Davis called my husband he not only was making these demands about how I should describe Sin Corinne of which bands he's in or, or which band's name to not include. He also, from, from my perspective, my opinion and my husband's opinion, seemed to be making veiled threats. He was talking about how um, ministry was protected by, quote, federal law, insinuating that maybe there might possibly be some sort of like, I don't know, legal action against me for outing this story. and. It was just a a fucked up thing to do. And I don't know why Steve Davis didn't call me because my husband, he had nothing to do with the story. My husband is my biggest fan, my biggest supporter. He always has my back, but he wasn't the one that was the whistleblower. I was. So why, why didn't Steve Davis call me? Why did he call my husband? Or maybe if he didn't have my phone number, why didn't he ask my husband to put me on the phone? I personally believe that Steve Davis was trying to be intimidating. Again, maybe that's not where he's coming from, but that was the only thing that made sense to me. Otherwise, he would have called me, you know? And maybe he's thinking like, well, I can't scare Lacey. People know my reputation. I don't. I have like a no fucks given kind of attitude. And he might have thought, well, if I can't get to Lacey, I'll, I'll get to her husband. Let me tell you this. If you're gonna try to get to me through my husband, you're going to be laughed at because he's got my back. I've got his back and we support each other. And if somebody wants to try to threaten me with legal action, first of all, I know the law very well. I've got a lot of people in my corner. Everything that I'm doing is perfectly legal. And to if, if anybody watches this and thinks that they can send me a cease and desist, you're going to be wasting your time and wasting your money because I will tell you this right now. Here's what you need to know about me. I will not be silenced. I will not be intimidated. You cannot shut me up and I'm sorry, I have to tell this story because my only goal in all of this is to promote 
change within this industry to get rid of this toxicity. That's all that I'm doing in this. I have a right to tell my story. And for people to try to intimidate me or intimidate my husband, it's not gonna work, dude. It's not gonna fucking work. You're not gonna intimidate me. I'm gonna tell the story and you're not gonna stop me. There's nothing illegal with what I'm doing. So I just wanna put that, put that out there. One of the things that um, that Steve Davis, ministries manager, had had also said to my husband during that phone call, which by the way, I was in the room, I could hear him talking. He was talking about the fact like, well, Sin, he did this a long time ago, you know, it's 13 years ago. Uh, and he started giving some analogy, like if someone got convicted of drunk driving 13 years ago, are you gonna hold it against him for the rest of their life? You can't compare those two. You cannot compare them. There are so many instances where people who have committed crimes against young people or against anybody, when it's sexual in nature, they almost always do it again. You may not know who Gary Glitter is, but Gary Glitter was a glam rocker from the 70s. He had a huge hit that became a sports arena anthem called Rock and Roll Part Two, which you probably know if you, you would recognize it if you heard it. I would play it right now, but unfortunately it would be a copyright violation. I can't play it, but pretty much any kind of like basketball game, any kind of sports arena thing, you've heard this song. So that was written by Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter was repeatedly convicted for possession of child pornography. He spent a lot of time in prison. Um, he was out of prison in 2008. And even though he had been arrested multiple times, did that stop him? Was he cured? Nope. He was arrested again in 2012. Then in 2016, Gary Glitter was sentenced for attempted rape, four counts of an indecent assault, and one charge of having sex with a girl under the age of 13. The judge in that case said it was clear that his victims were, quote, profoundly affected and had real lasting damage as a result of Gary Glitter. So when you're at a sports event or if you are watching one on TV and you hear that song, that song was written by a rapist. So when Steve Davis of ministry tells my husband like, oh, it was 13 years ago, these predators generally don't stop at one victim. Another thing that's really upsetting to me, I've mentioned blabbermouth already today, and um, I wanna bring them up again because when, when Billboard put that article out about Sin Corinne after an 11 month long investigation, a lot of other music specifically metal type of websites and magazines and stuff, they all picked up the story as well. And there was one hard rock website, notably that did not pick that story up. That was Blabbermouth. Why didn't Blabbermouth publish the story about Sin Corinne when just about every single other hard rock metal magazine website did? In fact, if you go and Google Sin Corinne's name, and if you if specifically if you type in Sin Corinne underage, you'll see how many times that story had been picked up. Why didn't Blabbermouth pick that story up? However, they got plenty of promotion for the pedophile Trip Eisen. So Blabbermouth, you're part of the problem too. Mel Brook once said, sex is like pizza. Even when it's bad, it's good. I also once had a guy tell me that men, sometimes they have a hard time understanding rape and sexual assault from a woman's point of view, because from the man's point of view, how could sex ever be something that was negative? So a lot of guys, they just don't really fully understand it. And to those guys, I would tell them this, don't think of rape from a woman's point of view in the same way that you look at sex with a woman. Instead, Think specifically of prison sex the next time you are thinking about, well, what, what is rape from a woman's perspective? Prison sex is the biggest fear that every man has about the idea of going to prison. And it's that fear of like becoming someone's bitch. Well, guess what? Girls and women don't wanna become someone's bitch either. It's fucking terrifying. It's physically painful and you're psychologically scarred for years, if not for life. So that's the way that women look at non-consensual sex. It's like prison sex for you. And um, oftentimes, you know, after a rape happens, after a sexual assault, women are so traumatized that they just want to forget that it ever happened. They will try as hard as they can to just bury that for as long as they can. They'll lie to themselves and say it doesn't bother them but that pain doesn't go away. And almost always 
sometimes years later, that pain will resurface in a way that usually is so disruptive to life that it has to be dealt with. And that is why sometimes it takes victims years to come forward. A while ago, definitely over 10 years ago, I had only been living in Los Angeles for just a few years. I was having a hard time in life because my mom, who was very close to me, she had committed suicide. And I dealt with this by trying to stay busy and pretty much just pushing it down as best as I could. But it was traumatic and it was devastating to me. Um, I just didn't want to acknowledge, though, the the pain that I was in. And I was probably drinking more than I should. Um, So one night I was at a club in Hollywood. I was watching a bunch bunch of bands perform. And through some mutual friends, I met Shannon Larkin, who is the drummer of the band Godsmack. So he seemed like a really nice guy. And all my friends, you know, all my guy friends really liked him. And um, so he, he was like, hey, let's go run around Hollywood and grab drinks together. And again, I didn't really know the guy, but I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I, I trusted him because he was friends with so many of my guy friends. And he, and as I said, he seemed like a nice guy. But unfortunately, as I said, I was really at a low place in my life. I was depressed, dealing with the, the loss of my mom. And um, as I said, I was probably drinking too much and we were just running around from bar to bar to bar. And um, I was just getting really, really drunk and I was getting too drunk. And Shannon Larkin was just staying in, ta- in town. He didn't live in California, but he was just in town. And so he was staying at a hotel in Hollywood. So I had parked my car nearby. And as the night went on, I realized I was fucking wasted. And I'd been doing shots and all kinds of stuff. I was annihilated. So I was walking with Shannon. He he was headed back to his hotel room. And I was like, I, I'm too drunk to drive. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, do I take a cab home, whatever? He was like, no, just, just come to my hotel room. And, um, you know, you can park your car. We'll leave it in the... Uh, like in the hotel parking garage. And he's like, just hang out in my room and sober up and and then drive home. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, didn't think anything wrong with that. So I went to his hotel room, went upstairs. As I'm going up the elevator, the alcohol is hitting me more and more. And by the time I got into his room, I was sick. So I ran into his bathroom, totally threw up like a lot, Um, came out of the bathroom. I was, had the spins, it was really bad. And I laid down on the bed and I, and the room was spinning and I was still nauseous and I just thrown up. Next thing I know, Shannon Larkin is on top of me, pulling my clothes off and ultimately has sex with me. I did not consent to that. I did not want to have sex with Shannon Larkin, but he saw that I was throwing up. I had the spins, I was wasted and he took advantage of me and he sexually assaulted me and it really fucking sucked. And I remember I, I couldn't even say no to him because I was so fucking drunk and I ended up passing out in the middle of it. And I came to hours later when the sun was just starting to come up. And I remember he was asleep in the bed beside me. And I, when I woke up, I didn't even know where I was. And I was looking around, on the, around the room. I saw him sleeping. I was like, holy fucking shit. I got out of bed as quietly as I could. I grabbed all my stuff and I got out of there as fast as I could. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I didn't tell anybody for a really long time because I'm like, it's Shannon Larkin. Everybody likes him. He seems like a nice guy. They probably won't believe me. Even if they do believe me, they'll be like, well, why were you going in his hotel room? What did you think was going to happen? Why were you drinking so much? I can already hear all the things that people are going to say to me to discredit me. Well, maybe you're just embarrassed that you had sex with him. No, I am not embarrassed about having sex. In fact, I have been very open about the fact that I like sex a lot. When I was single, I was very promiscuous and I have no shame about that. It had nothing to do with that. I have had plenty of one night stands. I've had one night stands with guys I don't know. I have one night stands with guys I do know. I have no shame in that. I don't think that any woman should feel ashamed for her sexuality. So that has nothing to do with it. It was the fact that I was so drunk that I had the spins. I was vomiting. And in that moment, Shannon Larkin decides I'm gonna pull her clothes off and have sex with her because he knew I couldn't consent in that moment. And, um, you know, it was, it was devastating. It was really fucking devastating. I can't even listen to Godsmack when it comes on the radio anymore. It's, it's fucked up. So, um, another reason why I never told any about anybody about this, I'm, I'm actually going to explain this to you and, and paint the picture for you 
with another story. So I don't mean to keep harping on the red hot chili peppers, but when I was doing research on this topic of, of sexual misconduct in the, in the music industry, I just, I kept coming across red hot chili peppers. And in 2016, Huffington Post published a story about a woman named Julie Farman, and she was a former record, record executive at Epic, Epic Records. Sorry, I can't talk. Julie stated that while she was at the record label, two members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers were also at the label that same day. She didn't say which two members, but she says that at one point they followed her into a storage closet. They cornered her and they sexually harassed her. And it really, really frightened her. And in fact, she was so she was so upset by it. She ran back to her office, she closed the door and she broke down into tears. Shortly after she came forward publicly with that story, a website called digitalmusicnews.com published an article written by Paul Reznikoff. And the article is simply called, The Red Hot Chili Peppers Are Innocent. So you might think, well, does Paul Reznikoff have some kind of insider knowledge about the situation or was he a witness to it to make such a bold statement that completely contradicts the story of Julie Furman? Nope, he's just a guy who thinks that Julie is lying. In his article, Paul Reznikoff writes that Julie's account, her account of what happened that day, quote, could be slightly exaggerated, could be totally fabricated, or maybe entirely accurate, but regardless of which it is, these accusations have serious ramifications for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. What about the woman? The Red Hot Chili Peppers are not the victim here. Paul Reznikoff continues, quote, for all we know, Julie Farman was rejected by a member of the group and felt rebuffed. Maybe she's a mentally unstable person off her meds. Are you starting to understand why women don't come forward and tell people when they've been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted? This woman is just trying to tell her story of when she was victimized. And Mr. Paul Reznikoff is like, oh, she's crazy. She's off her meds. Off her meds. Unbelievable. Paul Reznikoff ends the article by saying, quote, if there's real evidence, fine. If a judge rules against them, we should accept that. Otherwise, the Red Hot Chili Peppers are innocent, end quote. Okay, for starters, if there's real evidence, then quote unquote, fine. No, Paul, that's not fine. That would be devastating. That would mean that this woman who was violated, that you called a liar and you also wrote a whole article about her being a liar, you questioned her mental sanity. That would mean that she's actually telling the truth and that this band that we all know and love completely betrayed all of us. That's not fine, Paul, but I like how casual and meaningless this, all of this is to you. And also your statement of, unless a judge rules against them, they are innocent. That statement alone is so problematic as well. Here's some facts I need to share with you. In our society in the United States, rapists, sexual abusers, sexual harassers, they pretty much almost never get convicted. In fact, one in five of all women have been raped, sexually abused, or sexually assaulted at one point in their life. One in five. Think about all the women that you know. And you know how many women go to the police when something like this happens to them? Less than 22%. Why, why don't women go to the police and report this? Because just the act of reporting sexual assault, just that action alone of reporting it, it's incredibly traumatic. And People also, they think women are liars. Every woman knows this too. And I know that you're probably thinking, well, what about the women who actually do lie about sexual misconduct? Well, I actually did a little bit of research about this too. And it turns out the number of women who lie about this kind of thing, the number of women who do this, it's, it's a negligible, very small number. And in fact, the Los Angeles Police Department uh, had a report in 2008 showing that false reports in rape cases was less than 5%. And don't get me wrong, it is still wrong. If, if women falsely accuse somebody of rape, that is wrong. Those women are monsters and they need to be punished. But the women who are not lying are exponentially greater in number. In fact, less than 1% of rapes end in conviction. So the problem is not the false accusations. The problem is the sexual offenders who do this and get away with it possibly to do it again to somebody else. Rape cases are notoriously hard to prove. And the only definitive proof would be either a video of the incident, which is almost unheard of, or 
a rape kit, which is if the woman is able to go to the hospital after she's raped, the hospital can collect DNA samples of her attacker that was left on her body or in her body. And those DNA samples are then sent to a lab for a DNA analysis. The problem is that the system is so inefficient that rape kits are totally backlogged and most of them are just sitting on shelves collecting dust. The rape kits, which are literally the evidence, they never get analyzed, they never see the light of day. So the rape victim doesn't get justice and the rapist is allowed to continue to live among us. On top of that, prosecutors know that rape is hard to prove and they also say that jurors typically don't believe rape victims either. So when someone goes to the police and says that they were raped, prosecutors notoriously just don't take these cases. So the rapist is never brought to even into a courtroom. So when Paul Resnikoff and Digital Music News print an article saying, unless a judge rules against them, the band is innocent, statistically speaking, that is just not true. So why do we automatically err on the side of defending and protecting actual predators rather than defending and protecting actual victims. But this also, it really only happens in sex crimes. Think about all the other crimes that there are. Most other crimes, we tend to believe the victim. So why is it not that way when it comes to sex crimes? Imagine for a moment walking down the street and suddenly a guy comes up behind you with a crowbar he hits you in the back of the head and hits you in the torso, knocks you down to the ground. And then once you're on the ground, he kicks you several times just to make sure that you stay down before ripping at your pockets until he finds your wallet and then grabs it and takes off running, leaving you there stunned and injured and in pain. After you spend some time recovering, you begin telling people of this horrible trauma that happened to you. Imagine telling them this and then having them say, but did that really happen? Maybe you're just unstable. Maybe you're just off your meds. What proof do you have that this happened? If you're lying, you could be really ruining that guy's life. Who could ever know if you're actually telling the truth? Imagine if, if that's what somebody said to you. And the problem is with no video and no witness, this stuff is hard to prove. But for some reason with other crimes, we just tend to automatically believe the victims. But with sexual assault, sexual harassment, we, we blame the victims or we don't believe them. That's literally the only crime where that happens so commonly. The digital music news website where Paul Reznikoff drags Julie for coming forward about her sexual harassment, on their website, they call themselves, quote, the information authority for music industry executives. They also call themselves, quote, a highly influential source of news to millions of readers. So Paul Reznikoff, through digitalmusicnews.com, said that a female record executive who came forward about sexual harassment is possibly a lying crazy person who might be, quote, off her meds. And he said that to millions of readers. Let that sink in for a minute. Why would any woman ever want to come forward about being sexually harassed or sexually assaulted? And do you guys understand why now I never said anything about Shannon Larkin from Godsmack doing that to me? Who's going to believe it? And who's going to not blame me? My, my favorite, though, is when a woman is brave enough to come forward with her story and people go, whatever, she's just looking for a cash payout. I've read that so many times online when people are talking about women coming forward. And the thing is, cash payout, that, that is just not a thing. Courts rarely take rape cases. They're almost impossible to prove and juries just don't believe victims. So getting a, quote, cash payout, that is never anyone's incentive for coming forward. In fact, coming forward generally, generally brings even more negativity to the woman. And that's just not the kind of attention that, that women seek out. So for the record, no, I'm not suing Shannon Larkin from Godsmack. And no, I'm not going to the police either. And no, I'm not trying to take down a celebrity. I just simply wanted to tell my story. To conclude this episode, I just want to say this. All of this stuff, sexual harassment, rape, preying on underage girls, this is a serious cultural problem within music. You know, we, we had this culture of debauchery that has been turned into a culture of abuse. And then we have so many people that turn a blind eye to it, which only enables these predators. I feel like all this kind of like horrible abusive behavior has all become normalized and commonplace thanks to the mantra, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, here's, here's the thing. Music is 
wonderful. It's amazing. I, I love music so much. Everybody loves music. But this predatory behavior it is a cancerous tumor within it. Music is so important and we are going to lose it. The music industry needs to evolve, but it's going to take every single one of us to stop this. Now I'd like to offer some common sense strategies to try to fix this problem. Think about corporate America. They go to great lengths to prevent sexual misconduct in the workplace. They realize this is something that's prevalent. And so if you actually go to Google and you type in preventing sexual harassment in the workplace, you will find dozens of websites that detail ways in which we can keep the workplace safe for everybody. So this kind of practice is something that needs to be adopted into the music industry. It's also really important to, to understand that no change is ever going to happen if we are not discussing this. And I know it's an unpleasant topic. Like nobody wants to sit around and talk about rape. But if we don't, this is going to continue. It'll never stop. So I'm asking everybody right now to treat this almost like we're, we're adding an HR department into the music industry. And, you know, the other thing too, you got to understand is like, Music is a little unique in that we also almost always have alcohol around. So that's why this is even more important. So what I would ask is for the record labels, the managers, the booking agents, promoters, you guys have got to take responsibility. I would suggest putting in every single contract that you do an anti-sexual misconduct clause. And basically, if let's say you've got like um, a booking agent and they're talking to a concert promoter, they each need to have this clause to make it so that the concert promoters, the security there are policing the the venue to make sure they're watching out for girls who have had too much to drink that, that could possibly be taken advantage of, to watch out for underage girls, to watch out for bands that might be preying upon them. We've got to keep our eyes and ears open for this stuff and everybody needs to, to hold each other responsible. If a band is first getting signed to a record label, that would be the time that the record label and the band, when they're together going through the contract, they need to have a discussion about this. The record label needs to talk to the band about sexual misconduct and what will be the consequences if the band has allegations, credible allegations, especially ones that have multiple allegations. We can figure this out, you guys. Another thing that needs to happen is everybody needs to get into the habit of asking for ID, getting consent. Ask for ID, get consent. Ask for ID, get consent. I can't say this enough times. You know, if, if you are making out with a girl backstage or if you met a girl backstage, you want to send naked photos to her or get naked photos from her, ask her for her ID. I know that might be weird. That might be uncomfortable, whatever. But you know what's even more weird? People who are pedophiles. That is weird. You know, Carding is, it's not just to prevent statutory rape from happening, but, you know, we want to keep minors away from alcohol as well. If you go to almost every gas station, you or like a convenience store, 7-Eleven, that kind of thing, you'll almost always find giant signs that'll say something like, we card everybody under the age of 30. Wouldn't it be great if a sign like that was on tour buses, was everywhere backstage? We need a card, 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 especially at all ages shows, you know? And people, they they need to stop being uncomfortable and embarrassed about this. Do you remember back in the day, the 80s and 90s, there were bands that were trying to promote the idea of talking about birth control. In fact, Salt and Pepper has a song, Let's Talk About Sex. And at first, people were like, what, am I, if I'm making out with a girl, am I supposed to just stop and ask her if she's on birth control? Yes, you do. Because otherwise, you end up with an STD, you end up with an unwanted pregnancy. So like, it's awkward. Yeah. But we we got over it. We all learned how to talk about birth control when we we're about to have sex with somebody, you know? So that same level of, of um, adapting, we need to do that when it comes to carding also. There are a lot of girls that might look older than they are, but we need to be responsible. It's so, so important. And in fact, I would even say bands and tour managers, when you guys are getting ready to go on tour, day one, sit down when you're going through your day sheets. You need to talk about this and you need to talk about like, hey guys, you can't be having sex with girls that are too drunk. You can't be having sex with girls that look underage. If they look young, you need to ask them for their ID. So that need, that is a conversation that needs to happen before the tour even starts, between the band and the tour manager. And also the crew. The crew is responsible as well. How many times have you heard stories about security telling girls, I'll get you to hang out with a band, but first you gotta suck my dick. That shit can't be a thing. So let's talk to the security guards. And the thing is also, if you see something, say something. 
And we have to protect people who do come out and say something. We have to protect the whistleblowers. And if you are a band member and one of your other band members is doing some fucked up shit, as the band member who is a witness, you got to call the record label, tell them, you got to tell the tour manager, you got to tell the booking agent, you got to tell everybody around you. And then if you're the record label that hears a witness say that he saw some fucked up shit, you got to support that person. You can't fire him. You can't blacklist him. You've got to support the people who are coming forward with this information because all they're trying to do is protect the girls. So the other thing that that really needs to happen, bands, you got to hire more women. When you're going out on tour, your tour manager, she should be a woman your crew, have some women on there. You got to mix it up. You got to have diversity. It cannot be just a boys club. Hire more women. I think that will greatly help with this problem. But again, back to the live music venues, um, the concert promoters, I have seen so many times, like the guy who is the head of Warp Tour, they don't want to be responsible. But sorry, guys, this is your show. It's your venue. You got to be responsible. And you have to understand, there are predators that come to these shows. And, and listen, you don't want to be the hub for predators to find their victims. So you have to get involved too. You have to have this conversation with the band's booking agent. You have to have this conversation with the band as they're stepping into your venue, you know, and have a have a security guard whose sole job is specifically watching out for this shit, that's checking for girls' ID, that's checking for girls who are too drunk that are backstage. We need to be policing ourselves better because as I said earlier, the law isn't gonna do it. We've got to do this ourselves. It's up to every single one of us. The bottom line is that raising awareness is, that is the most effective form of prevention. We've got to talk about it with, everybody involved in these tours, these shows, and these bands. Another important thing, we need to have clear procedures in place on how to report this. We need to make sure that everybody feels comfortable in reporting this. As I said, we've got to protect the witnesses. We've got to protect the, the, uh, the band members, the crew who speak out. We also have to support the girls and women who do come forward. And it goes without saying, there should be a clear zero tolerance policy towards sexual misconduct in your band or in your business. People who do this thing shouldn't be allowed to tour. They shouldn't be allowed to work at the label. They shouldn't be on the crew. You know, we got to do everything we can to eradicate the music industry of the people who do this. The last thing I want to say is if you are a victim, there is help for you. Tori Amos, who you guys all know, she's an amazing singer. She's incredible, great songwriter. Love, love Tori Amos. She had a horrible experience when she was 21 years old. She had performed at a bar in Los Angeles and a patron asked her if he could have a, a ride home. She obliged and on the ride home, he raped her at knife point. Years later, she created the organization RAIN, which is an acronym for Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. And if you are a victim, you can go to their website, which is rainn.org. RAIN is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. They created and operate the National Sexual Assault Hotline, which is 1-800-656-HOPE which is HOPE is 4673. If you call them, you will be connected with a trained staff member in your area who will help you. RAIN also carries out programs to prevent sexual violence, help survivors, and ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. So if you are a victim, contact them. They will help you. Um, I also want to add, if you are interested in talking to me more about this, if you're in a band, if you work at a record label, if you are a journalist and you want to speak with me more about this, feel free to send me an email. If you go to my website, talkoflove.net and click on contact, you can send me an email that way. And lastly, I want to say, let's all reach out to the people that I talked about today. Let's reach out to to ministry and Al Jurgensen and ask them politely, ask them to speak out. Let's write to Blabbermouth. Let's write to all these different organizations that have perpetuated this problem, protected the predators and turned their back on the victims. And so when you reach out to them, do not threaten them, do not harass them, do not yell at them or curse them out. That will not do anything. And we cannot stoop to that level. So I'm going to put in the in the box below this video on YouTube, 
uh, in the description box. I'm going to put the information, the public information that is already on all these bands' websites or organizations' websites. I will put that there. And I encourage you to write to them, ask questions, be polite, and ask for answers. So anyway, um, I appreciate you guys for listening. I know this is a really tough subject, but I really, really hope and pray that we can evolve. I hope we can change this abusive culture in music and um, make music safe for everybody. So thank you again. Take care, be safe. And um, I look forward to speaking with some of you more in the future about this. Bye-bye.